today on an all-new Dr. Phil. Boy, have I got a story for you. She moved into her dad's house of hoarding. The dogs and cats use the entire house as their litter box. They're not just in the bed. She finds bed bugs in her towel. And this. A dead kitten stuck in the speaker, mummified. This is unsafe. It is a fire trap. Why are you living in this house? Let's do it. Is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today's going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. Boy, have I got a story for you today. It's interesting how people go through life, how they go through this world. Today, we're talking about a house that is so dramatic, so toxic, so chaotic, that it could practically be its own reality show. Our story begins in November 2019 when Lori, for reasons I don't understand, moved back into her father John's home. Now, Lori expected this to be a temporary living situation, but then when the pandemic lockdowns began in March, she lost her full-time job and has been stuck with her father ever since. With so many people losing their jobs right now, it's become commonplace for young adults to move back in with their parents. But just imagine if the home you were moving into looked like this overrun with 40 years worth of purchases, possessions, and what most people would just call plain junk. Let's just meet the cast of characters. First, there's Lori. Now she's a sharp tongued tattooed 22 year old and a recent convert to Islam. She also admits she is one step away from being a hoarder herself. Then there's dad, John. Now, John is in denial and believes he has only a very mild case of hoarding. Despite the house being in shambles and having a serious case of bed bugs. Yeah, I said bed bugs. And they're not just in the bed. When she showers, she finds bed bugs in her towel. And then, oh, by the way, there are also seven dogs and two cats. Now, you would think that that would mean that their litter box would be pretty full, but not true, because the dogs and cats use the entire house as their litter box and yard. Oh, yeah! And that's not all, there's also Billy. So who is Billy, you ask? Well, Billy is Lori's ex-fiance who John moved into his house three years ago. It's no wonder Lori says she's at her breaking point claiming she had rather be homeless than live there another minute. Well, then why isn't she? It is a total nightmare living with my dad because he's a disgusting hoarder. It's like my own personal hell. There's a desk under there. You just can't see it. That's my old dresser. I have a picture of me as a baby, like curled up in one of the drawers. So my bedroom, I can't even use. There's maybe two or three dressers in here. I can't even get into them. So my clothes are all over the place because I have nowhere to put them. There's another desk here I can't use. Everything back here is junk. TV doesn't even work. You go downstairs in the living room. You can use all the furniture except for the couch. The front room is the organized part of the mess and the kitchen is a disaster area the house i grew up in just keeps getting filled up with more and more junk my dad likes to go to yard sales and like buy stuff that looks interesting or he thinks has some sort of value these puzzles at one time were stacked nice old stereo and old television my ex-fiance billy also lives here my dad's kept him around because he's felt sorry for him and the kid really has nowhere else to go here's the old bedroom which is Billy's room, which was my childhood bedroom. This closet, I've never been able to use in my entire life, and it's just piled high with The garage itself, it'd just be a place to store junk. 
A piece from an old car, one of my first cars I used to own. This is from a 1976 Ford Granada. There's some like broken speakers. There's a sound system in there. There's a broken freezer and there's like rotting food in there too. One time my dad was going through the garage and he pulled out the speaker that was sitting in there and there was a dead like kitten like stuck in the speaker, just mummified. It was really gross. This house also has a bed bug problem. Then I noticed one day there was like a bug on my shoulder and I swear it was a bed bug. I saw the bed bugs crawling on the downstairs recliners. My dad always sprays his own bed, but they always come back. My dad's been hoarding as long as I can remember. Like my earliest memories is junk in the house. This has been here for 20 years, my entire life. Every year, the problem just gets worse and worse. The junk accumulates. My dad does refuse to clean up the mess. If my dad doesn't clean up the house, I will find a way to move out, even if it means being homeless. Well, joining us virtually is Lori. Why are you living in this house? You would be better off in a box under a bridge, in a shelter. I mean, it, what, why are you living in this house? Well, it's a bit cold to be homeless right now here in Michigan. Um, if I didn't have bills and stuff, I would probably find my own place. But you could move to a shelter. Seriously, you could move to a shelter and have a higher standard of living, a more hygienic standard of living than what you have living where you are right now. This is unsafe. It is a fire trap. It is not good for you mentally, emotionally, or physically so that's my curiosity. Why are you living there? Well, my dad's been having some problems lately, and I moved in to help him out. And it's just uh, getting overwhelming. So you moved here. in to help him out? Yeah. How's that working and for you? It's not working out that well. Okay. So if you living there is not helping you and it's not helping him, then we need to really think about whether or not that's something you need to be doing, right? Right. Um, so describe the smell. I, I've not lived in a house that is permeated by cat and dog pee and rotting food. What does that smell like? I can imagine it's not pleasant coming in the house after a long day of work and the first thing that hits your nose is the smell of dog feces and dog urine and... Um, it's just like it's stuck in the walls, like the smell. It's just been stuck there for years. You say a few weeks ago you went into your dad's room early one morning and you actually saw bugs crawling on him. Yeah, I, I was waking him up for work and there were bugs crawling on him and it was, it was just gross. And that's okay with him? Somehow. I, I, I don't know. He, like, laughs about it and I'm just like, I want to take a shower. Like, I want to just like scrub all my skin off like that's how it makes me feel yeah you said you once were digging around in there and you found a mummified kitten inside an old speaker yeah in the garage my dad pulled out um one of his speakers from his uh equipment for his dj and he used to do and there was a dead kitten either attached to like either a sign or a speaker i'm pretty sure it was a speaker okay look when when the place is so filled up with junk that you find a kitten in a speaker that's out of control right yeah and it was traumatizing because i love cats when we come back we'll meet laurie's father john he says he's not like those real hoarders on tv so he must be a special kind of hoarder we'll find out what's special about his hoarding when we come back I'm a master at repurposing. Oh, that's the 1969 Chevy Step Van. I had planned on making a karaoke vehicle out of it. The fire truck, I was actually going to make it usable. So it became a storage unit. Yeah, I'm not just going to toss everything away like my daughter would like me to do. And later... She's full of it. I've been working on trying to get stuff cleaned up for the last couple of years. No. no I have. That's not how I feel. Now I'm getting frustrated.
There's seven dogs in total in the house, and then there's two cats. My dad is too lazy to walk the dogs, and they go out on the back porch, which is basically no man's land. Around the time I started moving back in here, I found some Muslim communities. I decided I was ready to take my shahada, my testament of faith. I try to be a devout Muslim. So everything in the house is basically haram, which means like it's forbidden. So like the dogs are forbidden. The uncleanliness of the house is forbidden. Like it's very gross. I really have no room or space to pray. Everything conflicts and it, it's really hard to cope with. Well, Lori's father, John, says he recognizes the house is, quote, a bit of a mess, but claims Lori is just as messy as he is, has destroyed her room and refuses to even help him clean up. Now, John claims he's ready to clear out the house, but also says that he is overwhelmed and he needs time to sort out the valuable and sentimental items. I have a minor hoarding problem, but most of it is cluttered. Well, that's the 1969 Chevy Step Van. I had planned on making a karaoke vehicle out of it. My daughter, Lori, she describes it as being full-blown hoarding. You don't have to walk over trash to get through my house. Maybe out in my garage is a little bit junky. I'm a master at repurposing. I got a toolbox, an old dead freezer back there that doesn't work anymore. But in my living quarters, we have plenty of room to move around. My dogs move around. I clean up after them on a regular basis. We ended up with bed bugs. Used to get bit up at night. The last week or so, I haven't got any bites on me. I'm constantly spraying my bed, spraying the furniture. I really cut them down. I'm happy with the results of what my treatment has been accomplishing. See, these are all dead. These are all dead. I haven't gotten bitten at all, and everything that I've found has been dead. That's dead. Lori is very messy. Now, like her bedroom, I try not to go in there because I don't want to get upset because she doesn't pick up after herself very much either. I had two thirds of that room cleaned out at one time and she's added to on her side. She's not any better than I am, but I think she would rather complain about my mess than do anything about helping me take care of it. I'm 60 years old and I've collected things most of my life. I've collected model cars, comic books, guitars. In my backyard, I have an old school bus. Most of the stuff on this end of it can go. Those old beds can go, those old computers can go. My 1972 Plymouth Valiant that I've had since probably 87. She's rusty, but a lot of good memories in it. It's my legacy, I guess. The fire truck, I was actually going to make it usable, so it became a storage unit. Inside of it is some old beta videotape, some old beta machine. The mess and the clutter is overwhelming to me. I'm not just going to toss everything away like my daughter would like me to do. Just know it's going to drive me crazy for the rest of my life, saying, man, I shouldn't have done that. What's the old adage? One man's junk is another man's treasure. This junk is my treasure. You got a lot of treasure there. Well, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of junk, too. I'm not going to deny that. Uh, well, you know, let me I, ask you something. You know, people live with something for a while, and they look at it so much, they kind of just get uh, a, adapted to it. But look at what's on the screen right now. Th th this is your life. Yeah. What, do, what yeah. do you think about that when you look at it on the screen? Uh, when I, I look at it every day and go why what am i doing with some of this stuff and you know i've been trying to get it thinned out myself a little bit i just like i'm just overwhelmed i, I cry I, I cry about my mess well you're living in cat pee and dog feces and uh, um, why is that okay with you it's not I, with when the dogs make a mess downstairs i clean up the cat stuff is not in my part of the house, and it didn't have that smell in the house until she came in and brought those two cats. But, but it's it's your house, and you're you're responsible for the home. I mean, I'm just curious why you're willing to settle for this standard of living. They could come in and condemn that. It's this is I, a I fire hazard. It it's a it's a health hazard. We've lived there for what, forty. 48 years, 40, 46 years, something like that, in the same house. John, so she came in stuff. to wake you up, and there were bed bugs crawling all over you. Uh, that that freaked me out when she told me, because, you know, I at first I didn't even notice the things until she said, Dad, there's, there's something crawling. And when I found out what there was and how they came into my house, a little upset. So I've been treating it ever since. That's disgusting to me. I don't like that at all. But look yeah, at I, this. I, what you, you're saying you're treating it. That's like spitting in the ocean. Look at this. There, you this is Doc, all Doc, over the place. You've got to clean this out from the bottom up. 
Those were take those pictures were taken like a, almost three months ago. Those videos that she took with her phone with them stuff on the couch, and I've been treated constantly ever since. And like I said the other day when I was talking to somebody, I'm not how to get any bites, and I am finding dead, and I'm cleaning them up, and I'm doing what I can until I can get rid of this mess that's in the way. What are you spraying there? That's a uh, bed bug killer. It kills the eggs, and it's fast acting. I didn't have any on me like for over a week. I didn't get a bite. Number one. And I was getting bit up like crazy. All right, take a look at this. A nice, clean living space and then your it's living space. Not spotless, that's right. But that's, I know, I'd, I'd rather have something like the picture down below. But I can't say but. There's no excuse for my mess. No, there's it's not. Just, so it, stop it, making not, them. Here's your garage in the top up. left and a reasonable garage in the bottom right. That's the difference between where you are and where you can be. The question is, what do you want? Now, we're going to take a break. John admits the backyard in his home has become a jungle because he hasn't mowed the grass in over a decade. He also says that there is an old fire truck, a camper, and a school bus in the yard, all filled to the brim with junk. We'll talk about that after the break. I've always been kind of an entertainer. I was a DJ for 17 years. My dad live streams from his man cave. It feels like that's all he cares about. What's up, baby boy? What's up, dog? What are you doing? My dad live streamed while my grandmother was in the other room dying. Yeah, I didn't have anybody to talk to. I have this old camper. I had converted this to a man cave. And, of course, as you can see, it's turned into a kind of a collect all. Old clothes over here, there's a microwave, there's some, my, my lawn chair is a place to store them, an extra ceiling fan, some old brake shoes. There's more stuff around the corner. This was my man cave. I used to come out here and entertain people and we'd hang out, you know. I don't want to lose the camper. I just want to lose what's in it because I can use this as a tool shed. It needs a better roof on it, that's why it's tarped up. Why waste something that can be used? John says he live streams to his 10 to 12 viewers for at least two hours every single day. He says his fans are like his family, and he hopes that one day he can gain a big enough following to start actually making money. Uh, he said at one point he had as many as 1,000 people had tuned in. Uh, but Lori says her dad's live streaming is just another way for him to escape from all the real life problems he has to deal with. Instead of cleaning the house, my dad has dedicated almost all of his time to live streaming online and talking to his friends on the internet. Welcome to the Man Cave Live. Our motto is peace and love for all. I try to get on from around 6 to midnight and do a music entertainment conversation show for Man Cave Live and started trying to be a personality. And I found people enjoyed it. We just hang out and tell jokes. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, dog? What are you doing? What's up, baby boy? My dad live streams from his man cave. It feels like that's all he cares about. My issue is when it takes over your life and that becomes your priority rather than your reality. It's my release, my escape. I've always been kind of an entertainer. I was a DJ for 17 years, owned my own business. I have a little over a thousand fans. I like that. Sometimes I'll broadcast all night and only be like eight people, but there'll be people that'll pop in and out. When my mother died, I was broadcasting. That was very strange. Yeah, that was very strange. My dad live streamed while my grandmother was in the other room dying. And when the EMTs or whoever showed up to take her body away, him live streaming, talking to his friends while that was going on. Yeah, I didn't have anybody to talk to. My daughter wasn't here. My mom had just died. Some people were very hard about me doing that. Why are you broadcasting while your mom is dying? And other people were there for me and very supportive. As some of my followers have been like family, been with me through the last four or five years. They'll help me get through with the, the horrible times, the, the, the times when I just need someone to talk to. Well, John, this, this live streaming that you do, um, you're entertaining folks and all, as well as giving you something to do. And you're hoping to gain enough traction to monetize this, right? Well, that's a serious possibility, but I'm not holding my breath for it. I'd like to make it fun to do. Right. But, you know, when my, going back to when my mom died, 
when my mom actually took her last breath, I wasn't at the uh-huh. at the thing. It was like after, and I come back on and told everybody. And when when did you lose your mom? She was gone. 2016 on her uh, 82nd birthday. Uh-huh. I'm sorry for your loss for both of you. She she loved to watch your show. Well, obviously a woman of great taste and uh, <laughs> distinction. Right. Now, let me ask you something, John. Life's about choices, uh, and in my opinion, based on what I'm seeing here, you have all the signs of of being a a hoarder uh, in a in a pretty severe fashion, and we don't know a lot about what causes people to hoard. We know there are a lot of characteristics that go along with it. Do you want to spend the rest of your life uh, with piles and piles of stuff around you where you really can't enjoy the home that you have? You can't really enjoy having people around you. Are you hiding in all of this stuff, or do you really want to do something about it? I want to get it cleaned up. You say you recycle, but you don't. You just cycle. You don't recycle. You don't no, do no, anything no. with it. You no. just pile it there up. Is, there is there is some stuff out there in the yard. There's some Kansas tin in that I that I have a person come in every year and clean up. That stuff has not all been there for 30 years. Okay. There's some. I have a guy that comes in and cleans it up. That's where that little corral there is where I kind of throw stuff into and then I sort it out. The old school bus. Yeah, I guarantee most of that can go. Not a problem. I stick. Well, we're gonna we're yeah. gonna hold you to that. Uh, John says the real drama and toxicity in the house can be chalked up to Lori's ex fiance Billy. What the hell are you doing having her ex fiance in your house? John says he would like to kick Billy out tomorrow, but worries his daughter's ex would become homeless without him. Not your problem. We'll talk about that after the break. John's crap is taking up my space. I basically feel like I'm sharing a room with John's stuff. I drink on the weekends and I fight with John. Put the whole thing on it, damn it. That's what I told you. He kind of puts me to the side. It makes me mad. My daughter's ex-boyfriend, Billy, has been with us for almost four years. I think of him as a member of my family. I think of him as my adopted son. Being around my ex, it's a little bit uncomfortable. When we do interact, it ends up turning into an argument. Keep your nose out of my business. Hey. I'm like a mother, and I don't need you to be a mother. Well, you got mommy yeah, issues, yeah, that's for sure. Know. Billy does have a drinking problem. <laughs> he wants to get blackout drunk. This environment here at home is pretty toxic already without Billy bringing his own toxicity and baggage with him. Billy says he actually worries for his health because he believes the mold and mildew in the home might cause a recurrence of his cancer. Then move out. Take a look. John is in denial that there is a serious issue with this hoarding. John's house looks like a tornado went through it. John's living conditions are definitely putting my health at risk. I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma eight years ago. The house could bring back possible health problems again. John's crap is taking up my space. I basically feel like I'm sharing a room with John's stuff. In this room, there's old dolls, there's mattresses kind of piled up in a corner and a bunch of random stuff. John has a problem with just buying random things. I realized as soon as I moved in that there was a hoarding issue going on in John's home. I was a bit shocked. I drink on the weekends and I fight with John. Put a little bit of Parmesan on it. I'll put some Parmesan on it. I'll make yeah, it. Yeah, put the whole thing on it, damn it. That's what I told you. Put the whole f***ing thing on it. Well, somebody else might You're want it. He doesn't seem to listen to me all that much. Like, he kind of puts me to the side. It makes me mad. John was supposed to help me get back on my feet. I can't leave for one because I do care about him and I do care about Lori. I hope John will listen to somebody about cleaning up his house. Now, joining me virtually is Billy. Now, Billy, you and Lori moved in together in 2017, but then you quickly broke up soon thereafter. And she moved out and you stayed. Is that right? Yep. Why are you living with your ex fiance's father? Uh, for one, they're the only people I know, and I uh, 
she came paid across for the bus about tickets for him to come up here to Michigan. What's that? Yeah. She, 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 Lori bought him the bus ticket to come up yeah, here. Yeah, I bought him a bus ticket. He, he was homeless in Florida. He yeah, was he came and stayed at my house, and then she, Lori was living with her mother, and she said, I, I really need him to come stay with me, you know how it is when you love somebody. Didn't last maybe a month, and they got mad and threw her out, or threw him out, and I let him come back to the house because he know nobody else up here. Okay, you let know, me let I me guess. get let me let me let me get this right because I want to be accurate here. So, Billy, you were homeless in Florida. Yes, sir. And Lori sent you a bus ticket to bring you to Michigan, and you lived together for a month with her dad. Uh, no, with her mom at, at her mom's Sorry. house. Yeah. This just gets better and better. Yeah, it gets better. <laughs> she, she was at my house first. Oh, so I need a dance card of dysfunction here. They ended up kicking him out because we were fighting all the time, and he moved back into my mom's house. I well, into my dad's house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Billy, where do you get the money for your booze? Uh, I work. I work full time. I work 12 hours a now, day. And now, I work think about it. Now he works. But it's not to work. A couple of, only a couple of months. Okay, years, so you, you have a job, so you can afford to move out. Yeah, I can, but I don't know how to. Pardon me? I don't know how to. I've never been taught how to get an apartment or anything like oh, that. Oh, we'll work that out for you, no problem. He needs his driver's No license. problem. It's car. it's called walking into an apartment complex and saying, I, I want an apartment. Uh, John says he still has nightmares about a horrifying traumatic incident that happened when he was four years old. We'll talk about that after the break. got the case of depression, my wife leaving me, my mom dying, a lot of the people that I knew most of my life are gone. The junk accumulates, he falls deeper into his depression. The core of my dad's issues, I think, comes from some trauma that he experienced as a child. I watched my two-year-old sister accidentally killed. They would call it shaking baby syndrome. I was the only one that saw it happen. My dad heard her crying. He still has nightmares about it to this day. John says one of the many reasons that he has let the house go is because of his crippling depression. John admits he has never fully recovered from Lori's mother divorcing him, his own mother's death, or his baby sister being killed right in front of him. Now, John, you say when you were four that uh, your baby sister was killed and it was shaken baby syndrome. <laughs> Today, today they would classify it as the shaken baby thing. And right. That back then, it was different classifications. Yeah, but it yeah. was a violent. It was violence was done to her in front of you, and she died probably of brain trauma. Amongst other different, yeah. Right. It was. She was. She didn't stand a chance. Right. And that's a that's a <laughs> terrible thing to see. And I'm I'm sorry that you had to. Uh, experience that i'm sorry <sighs> no i understand that's a very difficult thing to go through as a four-year-old child or a 40-year-old man it doesn't matter uh that's a very difficult thing to have to deal with uh, my teens, have you ever it. dealt with it uh, yeah i've did some counseling and stuff like that i don't have the nightmares and stuff that i used to have all of this clutter and all that you're living with uh, does nothing but complicate your ability to focus on and resolve those issues. It's a distraction. When there's clutter in your life, there's clutter in your mind. When there's clutter in your relationships, then there's clutter in your own, your, your own mind, your own emotions. It's very difficult to ever focus on an issue, put it at the top of your priority list, and resolve that. And that's what I'm trying to tell you is you deserve to have that. When I look at what's going on in your house, your garage, your backyard, I wonder if that's what's going on in your mind and your emotions as well. And you say, obviously, your mom's death was not a plus for you. That makes your depression feel even darker. 
uh, leading to the house getting even worse. And so it's got a snowball effect. And this dysfunction can really get out of control if you don't choose to draw a line in the sand and turn this around right now. And that's what I want you to do. The question is, are you going to choose to do that or are you going to choose to wallow in all of this this disharmony? I, I, want it cleaned up. I want it cleaned up as of yesterday. You know what I'm saying? It's not I, I, every day I look at it. Say, I wanted it cleaned up a long time ago. I just, it, it, somebody says, what, well, you want to clean up? We'll clean it up. And then say, so are you going to help me? Oh, hell no, I got to do this. I couldn't even get Lori to help for 20 minutes a day to help do the dishes in the kitchen for crying out loud. Once well, you I, know you what? Know, I'm going to help you clean it up. And I'm also going to help you clean up mentally and emotionally as well. And we're going to talk about how right after the break. Lori wrote in claiming her dad was in total denial about being a hoarder. When you talk to him, he says, well, I got a little, maybe a little hoarding issue. Uh, in fact, she says uh, the only reason he began to recognize the problem at all was because uh, I began to get involved. But what we see in this house is just the surface level of the total toxic nature of what's going on here, in my opinion. I think that the exterior, the external world, is reflective of what's going on in this whole family dynamic, this whole paradigm here. I'd like to introduce someone to deal with this external issue, and that's Sharon McCrill. Now, she is a professional organizer and owner of the Betty Brigade. Uh, I love that, the Betty Brigade, a downsizing and clearing out company based in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that specializes in clients who have hoarding tendencies and just a really hard time letting things go. Now, Sharon's book, Downsizing, The Silver Tsunami, is a compilation of the past 18 years where she has worked with thousands of clients, thousands of clients, helping them resolve the logistical nightmare of decluttering. And Sharon, welcome. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, Sharon, isn't it interesting to see the burden that's lifted off of people whenever you declutter their lives? It's really true, and that's exactly a great way to put it. Uh, folks feel lifted, they feel lighter, and um, able to move on. John, one of the things I want to say to you, you said you just can't get any help with this. Well, let me tell you, Sharon is the real deal here and has, has got the troops to do what needs to be done. But I want to say something to you, John. This is something that we want to do with you, not to you. Yeah, there was a company I had called. I, I, she said the only reason why I was getting involved with this is because you're involved. She's full of it. I've been working on trying to get stuff cleaned up for the last couple of years, long before she made this call and I no. I understand. No. no. I have that's not how I feel. That's not how I feel. Well, well John, I let me, okay, I don't want to uh, listen, I don't have time I, to listen to you guys bicker back and forth. I want a question answered. John, I I very much respect that there are things of sentimental value, I mean genuine sentimental value that belong to your mother and that sort of thing. And I want you to know that we respect that. We respect we, we respect your right to to that. What I want to know is, will you genuinely work with Sharon and her crew to take full advantage and take this opportunity to yes, really sir. clean this thing up? Yes, sir. I've been, I've been wanting this done for a long time. You don't look. She tells me I'm lying. I, every day I walk through this stuff. You know, and I haven't had the money financially to have anything to help. I want somebody to get stuff. Now I'm getting frustrated. Like, yes. So I don't want to create anxiety. I want to create relief. And there are places that it can be donated. If there are places that people can use it or it can recycle it. Uh, Sharon is the master at this. You know what to do with this stuff, right, Sharon? It's true. We do know where things go. And we work with folks all the time on helping them find homes 
for their stuff. But what's the plan for the rest of this cast of characters? I'll tell you my thoughts about that when we come back. Well, I'm back with Lori, who wrote in about her dad, John, who she's concerned about being a hoarder and in an unhealthy situation. He has a roommate, Billy, and Sharon's here to help clean this whole mess up. And I said I wanted to work not only on the exterior problems, the, the, the clutter in the world, but also deal with the mental and emotional issues here. And look, John... You're the patriarch in this family here, and, and I can tell you, I can just give you my advice. You can take it or leave it. Uh, I, I think as you go through this transition, uh, this is going to be a time where you can clean yourself up mentally and emotionally as well, and I'm going to offer to get you some professional help with that. Uh, we're in the middle of the pandemic right now, so uh, teletherapy is a great way uh, to do that, and it just so happens that I'm involved with a company called Doctor on Demand, which is the leading telemedicine company in the country, and we, we founded that company. So I, I can make arrangements there. I'm going to jumpstart you with 10 sessions with a board-certified and licensed therapist there. I'm going to offer that to you. I'm going to offer it to Lori. I'm going to offer it to Billy. And I'm going to tell you, John, that I think you need to reestablish your home as your home. I think that Lori needs to look for another place to live. I think Billy needs to look for another place to live. And I think each of your therapists will help you all come up with a plan for establishing that. This is a dysfunctional paradigm here. And... I'm not saying you're all going to be fixed overnight, but we can at least put the fun back in dysfunctional. Get out of each other's way. Get out of the house. Live in a different way. Don't be there all in this, this situation. John is going to be making efforts to clean up his life, clean up his heart, clean up his mind, and get healthy and, and start working. And this is your guy's right. chance to hit the reset button, and get a new start in your life. Take it and run with it. Fair enough? Yeah. You know, there's, a lot, there's a lot of stuff that's got to be done, yeah. Okay. All right, if you at home want to have your own Doctor on Demand, go to the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store and download the Doctor on Demand app. By the way, Doctor on Demand is waiving co-pays for Medicare Plan B beneficiaries during COVID-19 to make it easier for you to see a board-certified doctor from the safety of your own home. So if you're a Medicare Part B beneficiary, your visit will cost zero. We're trying to make it easy. I want to thank all of my guests today. A special thanks to Sharon McCrill. Her book, Downsizing, The Silver Tsunami, is an absolute must-read. You won't believe how you feel when you unburden yourself with all this stuff. Uh, it's in stores now. For more information about today's show, log on to drphil.com. You can find me on all the social media platforms. And uh, I've been spending a lot of time on Facebook interacting with you guys, commenting on your, on your comments, answering your questions, and going back and forth about what's happened on that, that day's show. So I'll see you there. And don't forget to uh, go to Robin's podcast, I've Got a Secret. Hit the subscribe button and see all the things they're talking about there. She talks about some of the real innovators in this world, men and women alike who share their secrets for success. We'll see you next time.